Hey photographers! In this review of the Fujifilm X-S10, I'm going to show you how it works and operates for features like focus, exposure, color profiles and brackets, including focus stacking. I'll also demonstrate how it performs, testing issues like focus speed, burst buffer overheating, and rolling shutter. Uh, for the basic features and functions, please check out my Loves and Hates video. And if you're looking for a quick start guide to shooting video with the X-S10, check out my Best Settings video. <laughs> Links to both are below. I'm shooting with the XF 16-80mm lens. I'll talk more about that near the end of the video. As always, use the description to navigate to parts of interest. Uh, let's have a look at some of the photos I took with the camera. Granted, fall in Canada can be pretty colorful, and the 26 megapixel X-Trans sensor delivers sharp and detailed images with great color and dynamic range. Paired with this lens, I felt I fully captured exactly what I saw, even with full auto settings. Okay, let's start with focus, with the camera in the full auto mode, for exposure, white balance, and film simulation. Uh, that doesn't mean there's no control over the image. If the auto exposure doesn't provide the results you need, the rear dial adjusts the exposure compensation in auto and most other modes, making the image darker or brighter by up to five stops. By default, image size is the 3 to 2 aspect. 16 by 9 for TV screen and square are also available. And by default, JPEG fine. I'm adding raw just in case. And I'm going with lossless compressed. Now, I'm also using the large indicators mode to make it easier to see the settings. In the menu, the auto setting also locks the camera into the single autofocus mode, and by default, AF mode is all. Move the joystick in any direction to activate the focus screen. The front dial selects the area size, and in all sizes except wide, the joystick selects the point. Whether the point is large, or small, at the edge of the frame, or in the center of the scene. Focus is quick, which you would expect when the ISO is at 500 and the aperture is f4. When I soft press the shutter, the focus area turns green. That's also when auto mode displays the shutter, aperture, and ISO to be used. And as long as you hold the soft press, the focus and exposure are locked, as indicated bottom left, until you fully depress the shutter. And let's turn the light level down four stops, forcing the ISO to 6400. That does slow focus speed slightly. When using the LCD, after selecting the size, touch is also an option. In the top right, the touch mode can select the area, select the area and autofocus, and when shot is selected, focus and snap. The very last button dial setting, touch option for viewfinder, converts the LCD screen to a touchpad using the whole screen or a smaller portion so you can use it to set the focus point. On the focus tab, on screen two, by default, face and eye detect are on. A specific eye can be selected. Anne will help me demonstrate. When her face appears, it's quickly detected, and then her eye. Lock focus with the shutter key. As she moves, eye detect stays with her. Even in low-light backlit situations, Anne's face and eye are still detected, although it's less reliable. Some focus settings are not available in auto mode, and other settings like image stabilization are also dimmed out. Before switching to aperture priority, let's go to S, shutter priority, and determine how slow a shutter I can handhold. Then we'll get back to the other focus modes. When stabilization is turned off, with the 16 to 80 millimeter lens set at an 80 millimeter zoom, a shooting with the viewfinder my limit is 1 60th of a second. After that, it's blurred or smeared. 
when I turn stabilization on using continuous, even the image in the viewfinder is more stable, and down to one quarter second, it's sharp. Uh, that's about four stops. Uh, one half second, not quite, and at one second, it's done. Now I'm switching to A, aperture priority, which lets me decide the aperture while the camera manages shutter speed. So when the auto shutter goes below one quarter, I know the shot is probably not going to work. Now, while many Fujifilm lenses have a marked aperture ring to adjust the iris, some, like this first generation XF 10 to 24, do not. In that case, the dial in front of the shutter release adjusts it. The setting, also with an icon that reminds you it's the front dial, appears on screen. Changing the aperture adjusts the depth of field, creating a softer background, an effect you will see in the viewfinder and LCD after you soft press the shutter release. Again, at 80mm, this is wide open at f4, and now closed to f22, which pushes the shutter speed to one quarter second. Let's determine our tolerance for high ISOs. The XS10 has a range from 160 to 12,800 in the normal range. And as we work our way down from there, we can decide at which point the image is acceptable. And note that this could vary. For a newsy one-time event, even the highest setting might be acceptable. So under normal conditions, when I want a great straight out of the camera image, I'm not going higher than 3200. If the scene's a little darker, I'm taking raw and know I'm going to have to work on it, <laughs> then 12800. Although it's buried on screen 3 of the shooting settings, the auto ISOs can be configured with a maximum, so for me that's 3200, as well as a minimum shutter speed. With stabilization on, I'm good at one quarter, so leaving that at auto, which makes its determination based on the focal length. I'll configure Auto 2 to 12,800, the max. Uh, then there are also three super low ISOs, 80, 100, and 125, as well as two super high settings, 25,600 and 51,200. Now, these may be useful under exceptional circumstances, but you'll be giving up something. Dynamic range or color purity. Uh, this is what 25.6 looks like. Uh, this is 51.2. Your call as to whether a situation might be worth using these. So let's select those maximum settings, one quarter shutter, ISO 51200, continuous stabilization, along with mono film sim, and save them as a custom setting and name it extreme. Uh, then anytime you spin the dial around to C4, you're ready to go. I should mention one thing. Uh, one of the custom setting options is auto update. When this is enabled, if you make a change to the settings while you're shooting, it will update and save those changes when you leave the custom mode. With disable, it always stays locked to the current setting. Now, unfortunately, it is all or nothing. <laughs> Would be nice to have this setting available for each individually so I know that I'll never accidentally change extreme. Now we did leave auto mode rather quickly, skipping over P or program, which lets the camera control both aperture and shutter. Clever trick here, turn the front dial and the aperture and shutter both change for different combinations that provide the same exposure result. The rear dial still adjusts the exposure compensation. And now that we're out of auto mode, Focus modes like continuous and manual are available, as well as the option to increase the number of focus points to 425 to allow a more granular selection. Well, let's see how manual works. I'm going to revert to the standard display. In manual focus, it includes a distance ruler that's not part of the large display. The ruler also helpfully provides depth of field guidance, the blue area on either side of the focus distance, and you'll see it increases as the aperture closes. Not sure why it's not on by default, but I find focus check to be helpful. As soon as the lens's focus ring is turned, the view expands. It can be sized using the back dial and moved with the joystick. Uh, that's one of the four manual focus assists 
called Standard. The others, Digital Split Image, available in color and monochrome, and Digital Microprism will interest those who use similar displays on film cameras. Focus Peaking is a favorite of video shooters. Four color options, two intensities, Peaking displays the edges of objects in focus. Fujifilm's color management system is built around film simulations. Uh, showing you a single scene with all the possible variations isn't actually useful, because although there are some general ones, each addresses a specific situation. So if there are a few that you prefer, you can set up a film sim bracket, select three, and for each photo, all three are saved with a single snap. And there's really no need to choose these out in the field. Fujifilm's playback processing can add whichever film sim you like to any raw file, providing both flexibility and confidence that you're not ruining anything by choosing just one or three. Now, my thought about film simulations is that they're kind of like lots for stills, and it would be nice if some of the settings that the engineers are adjusting were available to photographers, either in camera or in a desktop tool, to create personal color science looks. Now, in my practice, color starts with white balance, which does not have a key nor a default position on the Q menu from the default 12 or the 16 spots. Now, of course, it can replace any of the current settings. I don't use the video record button and reassign that to white balance. The XS10 has three variants on auto white, standard, white priority and ambience priority, useful for getting that warmer interior feel. And then there are three custom slots, Change the size of the capture point with the front dial, OK to capture, and set. Kelvin from 10,000 to 2,500 with 10 degree stops, quite a bit more precision than found elsewhere. Oddly here, back sets. Then the usual presets, each has a color grid to fine tune. This is where I add a little red to create the skin tone color science I prefer. The 16 slot Q menu includes a color saturation setting. The back dial selects four up and four down. There are two color enhancement settings, color chrome and color chrome blue. Although subtle, the former adds saturation to darker areas. Blue increases the saturation of blue skies. As long as we're here, let's look at the highlight and shadow tone controls. These can increase or flatten the contrast in an image but that's easier to see using the menu's tone control curve. These are the same settings, but with the response curve, it's easier to see the minus settings flatten the curve for less contrast and increasing it to do the opposite. There are more contrast adjustments possible with the dynamic range, which is ISO dependent. Settings above 100 are available only with ISOs over 200. ISO 640 is required for DR400. As you adjust ISO, there's an on-screen alert to tell you DR is being adjusted as you lower the ISO. There's no off setting. I assume 100 equates to off. At ISOs of 640 and above, the alternate D range priority is available. With auto, strong, and weak settings, now activating this dims out dynamic range. But activating dynamic range doesn't dim this out. That's anomalous behavior. Then, as one of the drive modes, there are five HDR options. This setting takes multiple exposures and combines them into a single JPEG image. A single RAW file is created for each image, but there's no playback RAW processing for this feature. There are controls for grain, sharpness, and clarity. While you could angst over getting all these right while you're making the photo, shoot RAW with an ISO 640 and over, and you'll be able to add any of these in the on-camera RAW processing module. It might be worth creating a custom setting, or at least one of the auto ISOs for that. <laughs> one more thing. There's a filter position on the dial. Uh, then use the left side dial to select your filter. It's possible that you'll find these interesting, if not useful. 
I kind of like dynamic tone. And again, remember, if you're shooting raw, you also have the original to work with. However, these filters can't be added in playback. Incidentally, you'll have to turn on Screen Option Image Disp to view images after you've taken them. A playback is full-featured. In addition to the raw conversion, features like crop, red-eye removal, and voice memo. <laughs> turn it on and hold the AF on key to record. Press the joystick up to view image details, but this screen needs to be updated. Although the DR setting is provided, the DRP settings are not. The flash menu controls the internal flash, and when a flash is mounted, also provides good controls for external flashes and supports high-speed sync. For supported flashes, external flash units can be controlled with command and remote units in three groups. 